Hello class. Um, I'm sorry that we're still all separated um, and I hope you are all doing well. Uh, we are now officially starting the week on um, the depth Jungian psychological look at religion. Um, as this is my training in my PhD work, I thought it would be a really interesting way to close out our semester and give you just another perspective on how to look at religion. Um, because as you know, it's been my desire this whole time to kind of get you to look at it critically and differently than perhaps you were raised. Um, not only from uh, respect of others' beliefs and cultures, but also in how you interpret religion for yourself. So with that in mind, I scheduled answer to Yo answer to Job as the last thing you were going to be reading for the semester. So hopefully by now you've been reading it over the last couple of weeks. So this book, Answer to Job, is by Carl Gustav Jung, who is the primary psychologist that I am getting my PhD degree in his thoughts. Um, he lived between 1875 and 1961 and was a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology, also now known as depth psychology. So Jung's work was influential and continues to be so in the fields of psychiatry, anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, and religious studies, hence us studying him. Jung worked as a research scientist at a famous psychiatric hospital, during which time he came to the attention of Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. The two men conducted a lengthy correspondence and collaborated for a while on a joint vision of human psychology. Their relationship then ended poorly as Jung did not agree with Freud's theories around the sexual drive and Jung was interested in what he considered the religious function of the psyche, something Freud definitely didn't agree with. So over the door at his house in Zurich, Jung had inscribed in Latin, whether summoned or not, God will be present. This sums up Jung's attitude towards religion and spirituality in his life and in his work. They are an ever present and hugely powerful, even if unacknowledged factor. He understood our spiritual needs to be, quote, as real as hunger and the fear of death, unquote. In other words, he considered the religious function to be a basic, as basic and as profound, as essential as these other deep guides or archi archetypal patterns which govern how we try to live. We try to satisfy such spiritual longings in a myriad of ways. For some people, it is the success of their football team. For some, the pursuit of the perfect body or perfect relationship. For others, it may be a happy family or a satisfying sexual relationship, and for some, a lot of money or possessions. At the root of all of these, however, there is a longing to find meaning and purpose in our lives. These aims can go all wrong and become to our detriment rather, to, rather than to our well-being. For instance, being a fan of my team can lead to brawls and insults with other fans of other teams. The search for a satisfying sexual relationship can lead to endless disappointments and endless bitter searching. The attempt to achieve a perfect body can lead to anorexia and other eating disorders. The longing for money and possessions can lead to stealing, gambling, and corruption and to seeing everything, including other people in terms of the material worth. Midas had to learn this lesson the hard way. If you don't know who that is, it's a myth, look it up. That is where Jung's idea of individuation comes into play. And this is like the core of his beliefs. Jung developed the idea that the healthiest spiritual aim, that is the one that is most beneficial to the individual 
is that of individuation, which is the journey to become more and more fully and truly who we are essentially at our core. This becoming conscious of our unconscious motivations, fears, and longings is a lifelong process and can be followed along with many different paths, two of which are, according to Jung, analysis, so the process of working with um, a psychological analyst, and religion. In 1928, he wrote, quote, individuation means becoming an individual and in so far as individuality embraces our innermost, last, and incomparable uniqueness. It, is, it also implies becoming one's own self. We could therefore translate individuation as, quote, coming to selfhood or, quote, self-realization. End of the full quote there. We could also translate individuation as becoming undivided becoming more and more of our own self, having less of it projected or repressed or split off and denied. Okay, so what does this all mean for religion, um, especially if we look at it as a spiritual path? So just as other spiritual paths can be perverted to a lesser good, so too can religion. And I think we've seen this perhaps over time through this semester. A belief in God, belonging to a religious community, or whatever creed and faith, and following the required practices of that community are no guarantee that a particular religion is a life-enhancing path to pursue. It may be so, and particularly in the mystical traditions, which share major characteristics in all the main world religions. So the emphasis in mysticism is on personal responsibility, on a direct experience of being with God, or being a part of God, or a vehicle through which God's grace and gifts can be communicated to others. So in our last couple of weeks, we saw saints such as Julian of Norwich and Hildegard of Bingen as examples of this. They were both mystics. And as a result of that, they used their lives to help others, but at the same time, they, I mean, and it's easier with Hildegard because there's more information out there, but she was able to understand who she was herself. So there's always an acknowledgement of how much to do, the devotee does not and cannot know of God. That was seen in both of their writings of an appropriate humility before the unknown and the unknowable of God. In this, mysticism has a lot in common with some specific scientific approaches to attempt to understand the external world we live in. The danger in mysticism is of inflation, even of psychotic proportions, the idea that I am God. So that's when mysticism goes wrong. Instead, a healthy mystical mindset is summed up in a quote from Karen Armstrong's book, A History of God, which goes over the Abrahamic religions. She says that a mystic, a healthy mystic, thinks in these terms, quote, I am one of the innumerable names of God, as is everyone else, and my task is to access and facilitate the expression of this particular aspect of God, end quote. So it is clear in this formulation um, that it, it has a very similar purpose and it impl implementation, though not in the, its language to Jung's definition of, in, of individuation given before. So that mystical experience of knowing that they are part of God and they are trying to determine their expression of how how they are supposed to show up in that way is the same thing that Jung is saying of the self. I know these are really heady ideas and I really wish you could like raise your hand if you had a question, um, but I'm gonna give you a space on the boards to discuss what I'm talking about here or ask me questions. 
So the other danger of the religious path to spiritual fulfillment is fundamentalism. And we're seeing a lot of this right now in our current socio-political landscape. So fundamentalism is the, is the opposite of individuation in that it requires a belief in a static once and for all truth, which is given by others, by authorities, external